I'm continue talking about swimming upstream, and this morning specifically, I want to uh, deal with selfishness that each one of us have. You know, um, over the last couple of weeks, we've continued to talk about what it takes to be successful this year. You know, how are we going to be successful in 2020? And we've said to be successful in 2020, we need to swim upstream, so to speak. Society is heading in one direction. Society is um, doing what's easy, by and large. And to be successful in 2020, we need to go against the flow or we need to swim upstream. Swimming upstream is a lot harder than just going with the current and swimming downstream. But it's where real life is found. I want to start by taking you to a story in the book of Mark, and it's a story that... um, got Jesus, as the story about something that got Jesus' attention. And it's found in Mark 12, 41 to 44. It says, And he, he being Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And, and what I thought was interesting about this is Jesus purposely sat down and watched people put offering in the offering box. And then in verse 42, then a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which would make about a penny in today's society. So um, she didn't give very much money at all. I mean, we don't even deal with pennies anymore, right? She put that much in the offering box. Verse 43 And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty everything she had, all she had to live on. I thought that was really interesting that Jesus would, number one, that he would sit down and watch people as they gave their offerings, but then you have this widow put in her two mites, and that got Jesus' attention to the point that, she, that he called over his disciples and talked to them about the two mites that she had put in. She, he said that she had put more in the offering than all of the rest. Isn't that interesting? You see, that's how the kingdom of God works. It's not about how great you are or how much you do, but Jesus notices what we do. I thought it was um, really interesting that Jesus was sitting there noticing what people were putting in the offering. And Jesus does that. I mean, that's something that maybe is politically incorrect to talk about, but Jesus does notice and he is interested in what people put in the offering. What I think is special too is we've talked a couple years about God's kingdom realm. And in God's kingdom realm, this lady put in more than anybody else did. You know, it may surprise you But the Bible talks an awful lot about money. Last week we had an awesome baptism here. How many of you are excited about the baptism that we had last week? Wasn't it special? You know, we had an awesome baptism here. And you know, the Bible talks about baptism in 40 different verses. Prayer is also terribly important. The Apostle James said, you don't have because you don't ask. You know, the Bible talks about prayer in 275 verses. Another huge topic is faith. Jesus says that you'll have what your faith expects. You realize there's 350 verses in the Bible about faith. Love also is a huge topic. John said, how can you love God who you haven't seen if you don't love your brother who you have seen. Love is an incredible topic. 
an incredibly important topic in Scripture. 650 verses, did I just say that? 650 verses about the love that God has. But you know how many verses um, the Bible talks about when it comes to finances, material possession, and wealth? 2,350 times. In fact, 15% of what Jesus said in the New Testament is related to money. And it's also very interesting that Jesus connects finances to spiritual life attitudes and actions. And so I think it's only fair this morning that we explore what God says about money. To start off in Luke 16, Jesus said, If you're faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. I think it's um, what we should know when Jesus is talking about the little things, you know what he's really talking about? He's talking about finances. He's talking about money. Jesus said, if you won't be faithful in your finances, he says, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? The true riches of heaven are what we've been talking about for the last number of weeks or last number of months. The God's kingdom realm. That's what he's talking about. That's the greater things. The greater things are God's kingdom realm. The power, the relationship that we have with him, how we can connect to him, all of that are greater things. So the finances are smaller things. The God's kingdom realm is greater things. And if we're not faithful with um, the financial realm, God can't trust us with his kingdom realm. Isn't that interesting? Could I get one week amen? I'm not after your money this morning, so just relax. I'm just teaching you what the Bible says, okay? How many of you are sitting there and thinking, oh, Chuck, I wish you would have talked about something else this morning. But you know, we have to talk about this. Because it's in the Bible a lot, and I don't apologize for, for preaching about it this morning. I probably don't enough. Um, in verse 12, he says, If you're not faithful with other people's things, how should you be trusted with things of your own? It's interesting. Some things we need to know to set the stage. The first thing we need to know is everything is God's. Everything we have is God's. In, in Psalms 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That includes you, and that includes everything you have. In Psalms 50, verse 10, it says, For all the animals of the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. You see, everything in the earth is the Lord's, and... Uh, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All of the animals of the forest are his. When he says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, what that is, a thousand is kind of like if you would say something is a million miles away, you're saying that it's a huge amount, a great distance away. Well, that's what the thousand hills are. In other words, it's just another way of saying that God absolutely owns everything. In 1 Corinthians 4.7, it says, what do you have that God hasn't given you? You know, we like, to, we like to think that stuff is ours and that we have collected stuff and, and we take possession of stuff, but you know, everything we have is God's and God has given us absolutely everything we have. I mean, think about it. Uh, I don't know how big your bank accounts are, but I do know that whatever is in your bank account, I know that God has given you that. He's given you the ability to gain wealth. Um, God has given you absolutely everything. And my second point this morning is we are stewards of what God has given us. You see, we need to understand this principle. God has given us everything, and we're not owners, but we are stewards or overseers of what God has given us. 
A steward is someone who looks after things for someone else. Let's just use our imagination a little bit to explain this principle. Imagine that you have maybe a huge farm that's just right outside of Red Deer. How many of you can imagine how many of you want to be farmers this morning? Well, just, just pretend for a little bit. So you have this huge farm, and after this last week, you decide that you want to move from Red Deer, and you want to move to Hawaii. I don't know why anybody would want to do that after we've had a week of 40 below, but just, just imagine that that was the case. So you're out of here. You're out of this area. You're moving to Hawaii. You're going to stay in Hawaii, but you decide that um, you're going to make Chuck the steward of your property, and you could... Um, you could say something like, you could make a deal with me. Um, I want you to give me 10% of the income of, the, of, the, of your farm. And, and you could also say, Chuck, pay yourself a good wage, and, and I get to decide what that is. But um, Chuck, you know, all I want you to do is send me 10% and the rest is yours. Well, basically... Basically, that's the deal we have with God. We're stewards, right? We're not owners. But if that was the case for the farm thing, I would get to make the decisions. I would get to, to decide what to plant. I would um, decide whether to buy cattle or not to buy cattle. All of that would be on me. All of that would be my decision. But 10% um, would go to the owner. Sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? Because um, 90% I get to control and reinvest, etc., etc. You know, that really describes our relationship with God and our possessions. You see, when you understand the stewardship thing, it puts a whole different perspective on things than if you think you're the owner. You see, if you think you're the owner and you think everything is yours... It just, um, then you want to hang on to the thing. Then, then you want to um, be, uh, uh, you just care so much more about the stuff. But if you understand that, hey, all I am is a steward, the stress isn't there. And then the attachment to the stuff isn't there to the degree either that it is otherwise. So the stuff doesn't control you, right? You understand what I'm saying? If we can get this principle of we're just stewards of what God has given us, it actually takes the pressure off. It actually puts things in a whole different perspective. Understanding that we're stewards puts things in such a place that the things don't control us. You see, what you take ownership of, quite often in the end, that thing owns you. If you think that your money and your possessions are yours, and you get to do with them exactly what you want, 100%, they end up controlling you. And look what Jesus said in, in Luke 13. He said, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and be enslaved to money. God owns everything and we serve him. And these are good priorities to have. But the better we steward the resources that God gives us, the more he entrusts us with. You see, if, if I'm a good steward of this guy's farm, he might tell me, okay, Chuck, you've done a good job over here. I have this huge hardware store in Red Deer. Now I'm going to put you in charge of that as well. That's the way, that's the way it, just, it works. My third point is stewardship is a plan that God has created to bless his people. Stewardship is is really how God blesses his people. And there's so many verses that say this. 
And these verses that I'm talking about are speaking about money. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, he says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You know, God's plan for blessing is by us giving, us being willing to share what we have with others. And if we're willing to share generously, God in return will bless us generously. And if we don't, if we hold on to the things that God has given us, you know really what we're doing? Is we're robbing ourselves of the blessing that God wants us to have. You know, a verse that we love to quote is, And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul told uh, the people in, in the Philippian church. And that is a good verse, and we love to quote that lots. But you know what the context for that verse really is? The context is the Philippian church has been generous in giving to another church. They had been generous in doing that, and it's in that context that um, Paul tells them, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's good for us to think about some of these things sometimes. You know, I could go on and on with different verses like this, and there's a lot of verses in Scripture that basically say the same thing. So I hope you get the message. But when you think of stewardship, you also have to include tithing in this principle as well. And what does tithing mean? Tithing simply means you give 10% of your money to God. You know, sometimes we think that if we put five bucks or ten bucks in the offering, we're tithing. That's not what tithing literally is. Tithing literally is 10%, and that's what it, that's what it means. Tithing is um, 10%. In Malachi 3.10, in Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. The people were struggling at the time. They were short of finances. Their crops weren't producing, etc., etc. And God tells them, Bring all of the tithes into the storehouse and... Um, so there will be enough food in my house. And then I'll read some more verses a little later. Well, I'll read them now. Um, in verse 10 it says, If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. You realize this is the only place in Scripture that I know of where it says that we're supposed to test God. But here God says, try tithing, put me to the test. In verse 11 it says, your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall far from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. God promises incredible blessings to people who tithe. Tithing is 10%, and tithing goes to your local church. It says, bring your tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse at the time was the church. So if you um, bring, what you're supposed to do is bring 10% of your income to your local church. That's what, it's, that's what the verses literally, literally mean. And if you do that, then you will be blessed. I think sometimes... We think this is an investment plan so that if I give my 10%, then God is going to bless me with a financial return. And God does bless you with a financial return. There's no question about that. But the blessings are so much more than just financial returns. God blesses our lives. God, God opens up heaven's windows so that we can receive blessing. Your marriage will be blessed. Your, um, 
Your children will be blessed. It's just, I could just go on and on. Heaven's kingdom realm will be open to you to an extent that you've never experienced before. If you, if you look at things, if you decide that you're going to start to tithe. One thing, though, that I have to say, I have to um, put a condition on this. You are not buying anything. You are not buying anything. You are not buying God's favor. You are not buying His blessing. But if you're willing to do what God has asked you to do, then you will be blessed yourself. So you're not buying any blessing. God wants to bless you. You're just opening up the doors so that God can bless you. You, th- you see, um, so much in, in uh, Christianity, so much in our relationship with God, it's that God wants to bless us, but we need to put ourselves in a place where he can bless us. And if we do this, we are putting ourselves in a place that he can bless us. Why is tithing so important? Why does God use this as a method to bless us? Well, um, the first point that I have here is tithing puts God first. In Deuteronomy 14, 23, it says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. God doesn't need your money but he wants what it represents, and that is your heart. God wants you to trust him in every area of your life, and that includes your finances. And tithing really proves, my next point, tithing really proves that you do trust God. God wants you to tithe before you pay any of your other bills. You see, you don't add up your bills every month and then decide whether you can tithe or not. The right way to do it is to do it right off the top. And so basically what you're saying is, God, I trust you with everything. I'm giving you 10% and more. I'm giving you 10% and more, but really I'm trusting you with absolutely everything. I'm trusting God that if I give you 10%, I'm going to be better off with my 90%. And you know, Joyce and I have done this all our married lives. I'm not asking something of you, or I'm not not asking you to tithe. That's not the point. I'm giving you um, principles this morning. Joyce and I have done this all our married lives. In fact, we do far more than 10%. I don't even know what it is now. Let's say it's 50%, just because it sounds good. No, it isn't isn't near 50%. (laughs) But it sounds good, right? Joyce and I do that, and we've had blessed lives. We absolutely have had blessed lives, and um, we just trust God with everything, and we've had a little, and we've had a lot in our married life, and um, we've been blessed all the time. We also went broke. Also lost just about everything, but even in that, God's blessing was with us. You see, what I'm talking to you about is something far greater than just money, although money points to other things. Tithing also helps us to deal with our selfishness. You know, it's not hard, if, if impossible, just to decide that you're not going to be selfish. You need to back it up with, with action. And the Bible tells a story of a rich young man who was a leader who came to Jesus and asked Jesus what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. In other words, to inherit God's kingdom realm. And Jesus said, do the commandments. And then he lists, I think it's five here. He says, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and your mother. And the man said to Jesus, he said, I've already done these things. And then I like to think that everything is quiet for a while after that guy gave his response. I like to think that everything was quiet for a while and Jesus looked right into his eyes 
And he said, there's one thing you still lack. He said in verse 22, he said, there's one thing that you're missing in your life. What is that? Asked the man. You must go and sell everything you own and give all your proceeds to the poor so you will have eternal treasures. Eternal treasures, that's treasure for eternity. That's not just treasure in eternity. That's treasure for eternity. And then Jesus invites the guy to come and to follow him. And you know what the man did? He went away sorrowful. He never did what Jesus asked him to do, not in this setting anyways. Some people think that uh, later on he did, and he's actually listed as a man who was used after Jesus' death. We don't know that, but that's just what some people think. But I want you to see, and I really want you to get this, Jesus never chased after the guy. You see, the Apostle Paul said when he was talking about taking up offerings, he said, don't be under compulsion to give. God loves a cheerful giver, Scripture says. So, you see, I'm not here trying to beat you up or to try to get your money. You know, church doesn't need your money. I'm just trying to lay out a principle to you and you can, you can either join in with what I'm talking about and you will experience the blessings that I'm talking about or you can decide not to do it and you know what, your life is going to go on and I'm not going to be coming down to check your bank account. I don't do that. You know, maybe I should. How many of you want me to know exactly what, where your banking is? Oh, I don't want to do that, and I'm not going to do that. This is not about me asking you to do something so the church is blessed. This is me just simply telling you about a principle that if you will do this, that you will open the doors for God to bless you. You know, even the world understands this principle. You know, um, companies like McDonald's or companies that are very successful... They do this. You, do you know why they do it? It's because they're blessed if they do, because they win favor with people, etc., etc., etc. And uh, you don't have to do this. But I just want to tell you, and I'm going to close now, I want to tell you that what I'm talking about is definitely swimming upstream. It's definitely swimming upstream. But it's one of those things that if you do, you'll open the door to being successful in 1920. <laughs> it's not 19 anymore. I'm showing my age. It's in 2020. So I really hope you understand the heart I really hope you understand the heart of my message. The heart of my message is, this is a way for God to bless you in 2020. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I so thank you that it's your heart to bless your people. I so thank you, Father, that it's your heart for us to experience more of you, Father. It's your heart to experience for it's your heart for us to, to really um, come into heaven's kingdom realm so that we can experience life now, so that we can experience your peace. Pour out your spirit upon us and bless each one of us. And Father, I just ask that 2020 would be an awesome year for your people. Father, that we really would make the decision that we're going to swim upstream this year. You're so awesome, Lord, so we just praise you and we worship you. While all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how many of you would say, Chuck, I really haven't been faithful in this area of dealing with my money. 
but I'm going to make a change and I'm going to start to be a better steward of the resources that God has given me. If that's you, just show me by raising your hand. Yeah, I see those hands. Lots of hands. So Father, I just ask, Father, that you would really um, give the people who raised their hands the courage to do these things that you've called them to do. Father, that they would um, not let selfishness control them. Father, but that they would be open-handed with people who are needy. Father, that they would follow your principles and Scripture. And Lord, that they would put themselves in a place where they truly can be blessed. We just thank you and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name.